Thank you everyone for joining us for our webinar part two, Managing Employees and Volunteers During COVID-19. My name is Melanie and I'm the Communications and Network Engagement Manager here at ONN. If you're new to the Ontario Nonprofit Network, welcome. We're a provincial network of Ontario's 58,000 nonprofits and charities focused on policy, advocacy, and services to strengthen Ontario's nonprofit sector as a key pillar of our society and our economy. If you're already a member of ONN, welcome back and thank you so much for your support. Our public policy research and advocacy work would not be possible without you. If you experience any technical difficulties during this webinar, such as a visual lag, we recommend you closing your browser and then reopening it, but stay on the line with us. If you experience any problems, you can also type them into the chat box or call our office at 416-642-5786. So while we're waiting for a couple more folks to join, I'm just gonna launch a poll to see what you guys are looking forward to the most to learn about during this webinar. So are you uh, excited to learn about policy updates regarding Canada's nonprofit and charitable sector from Imagine Canada? Are you interested in learning more about employment benefit updates or health and safety issues affecting nonprofits? Um, are you interested in learning about the implications of temporary layoffs and workforce reductions to your team? Or are you looking forward to diving deeper and learning more through our live question and answer period? I'll let this be open just for a couple more seconds. It's great to see so many people interested in different things. We are going to be covering all these topics today. Plus, we'll make sure to send you a slide deck that includes some notes from today's presentation in addition to the recording. If you do have any questions for the speakers during this presentation, please feel free to type them into the question box. We're gonna to try to get to as many questions as possible during the question and answer period. Additionally, as I said, the webinar recording will be available for you to view afterwards, and we'll make sure that's sent to you by the latest Monday, April 27th. I'd like to do a land acknowledgement before we get started. ONN recognizes that we are on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit. This land has been stewarded by many Indigenous pe peoples for time immemorial, including the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. Toronto is also part of the Métis homeland and is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Presenting this webinar with ONN today is Imagine Canada, Canada's national advocacy organization for the nonprofit and charitable sector. Bill, the Director of Public Policy for Imagine Canada, has joined us today and will be sharing some important policy updates for our sector. Over to you, Bill. Thanks. Um, just a few things uh, from the policy and advocacy perspective. Um, as you may be aware, uh, Imagine Canada, alongside uh, a number of other organizations, have come up with a recommendation to the federal government for a grant program uh, for charities and nonprofits. This would be something that would be unrestricted funds um, that would cover some of the gaps that have been left by the wage subsidy. So for organizations that don't have paid staff um, to help with fixed costs, for organizations that may not have seen a revenue decline, but have seen a demand increase, um, meeting some of those costs, um, and it would help meet with you know various fixed and organizational costs. Our intent with this is that it would be extremely broad-based, um, very flexible. Um, we've got a letter campaign going right now on this one, and our thanks to anyone who may have already signed that. Um, we'd encourage everybody to have a look and to uh, take 20, 30 seconds to uh, to send the letter. Um, it'll figure out who your MP is, send it to them, and then the copies to various ministers, the prime minister, opposition leaders, so that we can show that there is support for this idea. 
Um, one other update, um, you may have heard that last week the government announced that they were going to be bringing in a, uh, a rent assistance program uh, for, uh, for people who are paying rent to commercial landlords. Um, we're working to determine where the government sits right now in terms of charities and nonprofits being able to take advantage of this. It seems like it's an open question right now. So um, to the extent that uh, any of you would benefit from being eligible for any rent assistance as they get it developed, uh, we'd encourage you to get in touch with your members of parliament and let them know that we're keeping an eye on this, that charities and nonprofits need this just as much as the private sector. And especially those of you who may be based in or live in Toronto Centre, where your MP happens to be one Bill Morneau, Minister of Finance, um, it would be really helpful for him to be hearing that message from people on the ground. We're also starting to, um, we're starting to think through the next few weeks and months in terms of, depending on how the situation develops and some of these initiatives that have been put in place initially for a limited period, uh, so the wage subsidy particularly, and what things might look like, what the needs might be going forward if any of those uh, get extended depending on the economic situation. So if you've got any um, experiences, any thoughts, any recommendations as to uh, what your needs would be beyond the March, April, May period, if you can start feeding that information to us so that we can start looking for patterns in uh, you know, where there have been gaps, where there have been issues with how things have rolled out so that if the government is looking to extend any of these things, we can, um, we can share those perspectives with them and see if we can get some of those programs improved so that they uh, provide more immediate benefit for people on the ground. The other thing too I should mention related to the wage subsidy is the CRA does now have a calculator online. Um, it walks you through the various definitions and allows organizations to basically do a calculation, estimate what they'd be um, what they'd be eligible for and get that application process rolling on that. Um, we've got a link to that. We've shared that through social media. I believe we've got a link to it on our website right now, but um, you can also visit the CRA webpage and they've got that information there as well. So that's it from this end for now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bill, for the great update. Uh, so next I would like to introduce our main speaker. So our main presenter today is Gita Anand. Gita is the Associate Counsel for Miller Thompson Lawyers. Gita's practice focuses on labor relations, employment law, and litigation. Advising and representing management on a wide range of matters, Gita acts for her clients within the private and public sectors in both union and non-union workplaces. Gita also acts as an investigator and fact finder in the public and private sectors, conducting work workplace investigations involving employment-related issues. Um, thank you so much, Gita, for generously donating your time again to Ontario Nonprofit Network and to all the nonprofits across Canada that you're supporting through this presentation. We really appreciate it. And now, um, over to you, Gita. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back. If you had joined us at the end of March, uh, and welcome if uh, you're tuning in now to part two. Uh, the legal landscape as far as employment law is concerned is uh, is evolving fast and furious as uh, various governments uh, issue emergency orders, uh, legislation and directives to uh, employers and uh, provide benefits for employees. So uh, what I'd like to do uh, first is to talk about uh, a couple of government initiatives in relation to COVID-19, one uh, which had existed uh, at the end of March, but has been expanded, and uh, the um, 
wage subsidy, which had just been announced on the day that our previous seminar or webinar had taken place, and uh, to speak a little bit about how that has now been uh, detailed by the government. Uh, and then we'll go on to another topic and, and then the last topic. So first of all, the Com Canada Emergency Response Benefit, or the CERB, uh, was introduced to provide temporary income to support workers who had stopped working due to COVID-19. And this um, can be claimed by employees or self-employed individuals who have stopped working and or are earning less than a thousand dollars a month um, in order to be eligible uh, employees must have had income of at least five thousand dollars in 2019 or in the 12 months prior to the application and under this program employees are expected to be without employment for at least 14 consecutive days in the initial four week period. And it's available at $2,000 a month for four months, March to June. And applications are actually fairly easy. Uh, they can be made online through a My Account or Service Canada account, and also by calling uh, Service Canada. So uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting and quick, nimble response. And almost, uh, as you can probably, if you probably have seen, some of the commentators are saying it's, you know, on the path towards a universal basic income type vehicle. Um, so these changes that were made and introduced are retroactive to March. And um, so, so that's the CERB. The second thing that was introduced uh, at the end of March was the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. Eda, are you still there? Okay. It looks like we've had a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, so while we get Gita back up on the sound, um, we're just going to have a quick pause. Uh, Gita, you just broke up for a bit. Do you mind repeating the last couple sentences? Certainly. So Thank you. Uh, as of April 11th, Parliament adopted the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, which will reimburse employers for 75% of their employees' salaries up to a limit of $847 per week for those employers or businesses that qualify. And this subsidy runs for a 12-week period starting March 15th and continuing to June 6, 2020. Now, the program is intended to prevent or reduce further job losses as a result of COVID-19 and to encourage employers to recall employees who have been laid off as a result of the crisis and facilitate a return to normal op uh, operations once that becomes possible. Um, so one interest, uh, important thing is that although there's an $847 employee limit per employee limit on the uh, wage subsidy, there's no overall limit on the subsidy amount that an eligible employer may claim. So the total amount of the wage subsidy that an employer may claim is limited only by the number of employees that the employer has. So employers who may benefit from the subsidy include um, a number of types of corporations, including nonprofit organizations and registered charities. Um, so there is a way to calculate it. And as, as uh, the previous speaker said, uh, the calculator is now available. And that calculator is uh, available and up and running, I believe, as of Monday. So um, that will assist employers in calculating the amount of the subsidy. Um, one of the things that uh, 
is important is that uh, employers have to, in order to qualify, an employer must have seen a reduction in revenue of 15% in March of this year or 30% in April or May. And um, one of the questions that, that has come out is, is how do not-for-profits or charities actually calculate revenue? So um, there has been some discussion about this. And um, in the case of an eligible entity that is a registered charity, it includes revenue from a related business, uh, gifts, and other amounts received in the course of the charity's ordinary activities, provided that the charity may elect to exclude government funding from all prior and current reference periods. So there has been a, a, some information as to how that is calculated for purposes of the wage subsidy. Um, so uh, this wage subsidy also has an interaction with other government programs. Uh, the government doesn't intend to have any duplication of benefits relating to a single individual. So um, the approach has been to uh, include flexibility to reverse repay, uh, payments of the CERB uh, and to, uh, if, if there's a wage subsidy in place uh, and if employers are, who are eligible for the wage subsidy are already participating in a work sharing program as part of the employment insurance uh, system, then the EI benefits already being received by employees through that arrangement will reduce the benefit uh, that the employer is entitled to receive under the wage subsidy. So uh, there is uh, an intention that uh, the benefits don't uh, accumulate, but they act together um, so that uh, employees benefit as, as best I think they can. Just um, on the, uh, the wage uh, subsidy wage calculator, um, you can sign up through your business account or an account called represent a client uh, through portals um, uh, with the government of Canada. And the application process will be opened on April 27th, as I've said, and funds will begin uh, to be released on May 5th is the latest information that we have. So in terms of uh, government uh, initiatives, there, there are also others which are not necessarily related to employment, but certainly, you know, relate to the viability of an organization and a business. So there's the emergency business account. There's um, uh, there may be, uh, as was said already, uh, a possibility of rent assistance. And um, you know, I think that every day we see something in in another sector. Yesterday uh, there was some an announcement about. Uh, uh, aid to students, which uh, included the ability to provide uh, students with uh, employment uh, upcoming. So, and that may also affect uh, some of your organizations if you intend to hire students. So, we don't have very much information on that, but uh, I expect it would be forthcoming in the uh, next uh, weeks ahead. So, those are the the primary government uh, initiatives that I, I thought I would speak about today. There are many uh, government programs, as we discussed last time, that are available. There is the uh, top up to the, uh, the sub plans, there's the work share programs. Those are complex programs, but they still are available to assist uh, employers. Now, um, one area that uh, we as employment lawyers uh, receive a lot of questions about are occupational health and safety matters in the workplace. And 
health and safety has, has always been a primary concern, but particularly during a pandemic, um, health and safety has uh, risen, well, have stayed at the top and is, is primary uh, in terms of focus. And uh, not only are employers expected to have a uh, plan or do a workplace risk assessment, uh, the legislation in all the provinces uh, and, and certainly in the federal sector require a risk assessment, but risk assessments have to be done by employers uh, and information has to be provided to employees. So, and, and information includes instruction. So, uh, employers have to advise workers of known health and safety hazards or risks associated with their work and provide adequate information and instruction to enable them to perform their work safely. And accordingly, um, I would say that all employers have to conduct ongoing health and safety assessments of workplaces um, to respond to uh, questions, respond to my next topic, which is work refusals, and consider the uh, availability of alternative work, um, if that is an issue. So uh, the question that we receive, I think most often is, what is the right of refusal or the right to refuse to perform unsafe work or perceived unsafe work? So the basic premise is that all workers have a right to a working environment that protects their health and safety. And so all the laws, the occupational health and safety laws across the country, generally speaking, uh, allow an employee to refuse uh, to perform their work. It looks like we lost Gita for a second. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wait a couple moments to see um, if our internet comes back in. So if you can just pause and hold with us, that would be great. Thank you. Organism in in all jurisdictions and Sorry, the language. Uh, um, yes. You just broke out for um, a quick moment. Do you mind just repeating the last two sentences? Sure. Thank so, you so much. So um, all of the legislation across the country has have provisions where employees may trigger the uh, refusal to perform work where they have reason to believe their health or that of under, other individuals is in jeopardy. Um, and depending on the jurisdiction that triggers a variety of obligations on the part of the employer. So the next question is, what is the threshold for the exercise of that kind of right? And so uh, it's a an exceptional mechanism. Um, these types of work refusals cannot be exercised uh, lightly or used to solve workplace problems. Um, and, and what happens is, uh, provincial and federal work refusals trigger, uh, oh, I am sorry. Uh, my apologies. Um, a trigger a right, uh, uh, trigger an investigation by a provincial authority or at the very least by a joint health and safety committee if, if a joint health and safety committee uh, exists. And, um, so what happens then is, uh, you know, if a joint health and safety committee exists, then there is an investigation. Uh, if the Ministry of Labor is called in, there is an investigation. And what can the employer do while waiting for an authority to render a decision? An employer can ask an employee to do uh, another job, alternative work or may ask another worker to perform the work which was refused, but only if the 
employer informs the replacement worker of the other workers refusal and the grounds for refusing it um, and the alternative worker may then have the right to accept or refuse to do the work in question um, are there exceptions to the right to refuse unsafe work yes uh, generally there are two exceptions to the right to refuse unsafe work first dangers or hazards which are inherent to the workers work or which are normal conditions of the workers employment will not generally give rise to the right of refusal and secondly when the right to refuse would directly endanger the life safety or health of another person the worker is usually prohibited from exercising a right to refuse unsafe work and so these types of exceptions would include for example frontline workers police officers firefighters healthcare workers uh, with regard to certain dangers so that brings us to whether an employee can refuse to perform work based on the covid-19 pandemic and it is possible that the covid-19 pandemic may create the basis for a legitimate work refusal but that would be contingent on factors which would include and are not limited to um, the state of the COVID-19 situation in the workers um, particularly a particular city region province and workplace um, the age and the health of the particular worker the type of workplace the specific field of work, the number of workers in the workplace and whether or not uh, social distancing is possible, um, the measures adopted by the employer to prevent the transmission of COVID-19, including workplace hygiene and uh, personal protective equipment uh, provided, uh, whether or not the employee or the employer has been diagnosed with COVID-19, whether the worker or the circumstances fall into a legislative exception on the right to refuse unsafe work, and then of course any other factual circumstances which are relevant. Um, so you know it's an open question. In, in some recent cases uh frontline workers who have been provided with ppe and who um, have been um, provided with information instruction and uh all of the uh and a risk assessment uh have been deemed by the ministry not to have uh been asked to do unsafe work so uh but of course now you you may be aware that there are some court cases uh, brought by uh, the Ontario Nurses Association at this point uh, at court um, relating to the provision of adequate PPE and other issues so uh, it's an open question uh, certainly employers have to do everything that they can possibly do uh, to um, protect the health and safety of the workers that work uh, in their operations. Um, the next uh, topic I just want to touch upon, which is, uh, is another big topic, which is uh, workforce reductions. Um, uh, many of you and, and many employers, and, and certainly we read, about how many job losses there have been in the past uh, uh, four weeks. Um, what seems evident uh, is that people want to work. So um, in the face of the options available, employers are being encouraged uh, by governments to maintain uh, employment or at least maintain the link to employment and perhaps future employment as best they can in in this crisis so 
um, in Ontario, there, the legislation was amended to uh, add COVID-19 as a, a reason to provide emergency unpaid leave. So um, there is an unpaid leave of indefinite duration that can be provided if, if uh, the criteria is met. Uh, the employer is entitled to, to um, ask for proof if someone uh, is claiming emergency leave uh, and that proof is reasonable proof. So in ordinary times, emergency leave uh, that is granted, the employer can ask for a doctor's note, for example, if an employee is sick. In this case, um, the advice is that you shouldn't be asking for a doctor's note at this time. Uh, the doctors are very busy and it isn't uh, seen as a, a necessity to have a, a licensed medical practitioner sign off on a note. Uh, so reasonable proof, good question what that is, but uh, if the person has COVID-19, that would be uh, proof. Um, now, uh, if employees continue to work, but on a reduced uh, level, then there is the temporary wage subsidy that we uh, talked about earlier. There is uh, the option of a temporary layoff and the temporary layoff language uh, in the Ontario Employment Standards Act is uh, temporary layoff may take place uh, for 13 weeks uh, but if you pay benefits uh, then that layoff period can be extended for up to 35 weeks It seems like um, Gita's internet has just gone out for a moment, so we're just going to pause again for a couple seconds until it comes back in. Cover self-employed individuals. So there Hi, is that option. Sorry, um, Hello? To interrupt again. Um, you just had cut out for the past two sentences. Do you mind just covering okay. those again? Sure. Uh, okay. Employees. Employees who are temporarily laid off may be eligible for the uh, the CERB benefit, which uh, which is uh, uh, available, which is two thousand dollars a month um, for a maximum of four months. So there is that uh, additional um, wage assistance. Uh, there is the work share and sub plan, as I, I mentioned before, those are more complex plans. Uh, and then the other option uh, which employers are following is that, uh, you know, uh, employees are terminated, businesses are shut down uh, with some uh, thinking that they're going that there will be a change in the business model moving forward. So uh, workforce reductions are all over the map. One of the things that's important to understand, and it's still an open question, is how are the courts and tribunals going to treat um, term temporary layoffs, uh, which uh, for employees who are not unionized. And so for non-union employees who are temporarily laid off, will that be a constructive dismissal? Uh, theoretically, possibly so. Uh, perhaps this will be a fact, the COVID-19 will be a factor in determining uh, the reasonableness though of the employer's uh, uh, decision making and it may in fact constitute a, a factor beyond the employer's control which may catch judicial and tribunal attention to uh, 
avert a constructive dismissal finding. So that's still an open question. Uh, so that's that's it for workforce reductions in terms of general comments, but I'm happy at this point to, to answer some questions, if there are any. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gita. So we have a lot of questions that are coming in. Um, so thank you, everyone, for putting writing down your questions. We're going to try to get to as many as possible today. Um, so... To get started, we actually had um, one that just came in that I found was um, interesting, and it was about the refusal to go back to work once everything is open. So the example this person gave is, what if you have, let's say, a front desk clerk who requires, in order to do their job, they need to be at the front um, welcoming people to come into the office. Once the government opens offices up, is that person required to come into work? Or are they allowed to refuse to come into work because they feel like it's still unsafe, even if public health has said offices can open up again? So if the employer is following the guidelines of public health uh, and the uh, guidelines and, and directives of the city of Toronto, let's say it's in Toronto or whatever municipality it happens to be, uh, then a work refusal may be unreasonable. Uh, if the employer, you know, I think that it depends, it's kind of hard to answer in a vacuum, but let me just say that I, it would be my expectation that social distancing is going to, or physical distancing is going to be around for a long time. So if someone is at reception, uh, you know, there are measures that the employer can take that will certainly maintain the distancing, even at reception. And and I and I'm sure many of you have been in uh, retail establishments or places where um, the social the physical distancing is maintained and business can be conducted. So uh, it would be, in my view, unreasonable for someone to just not come to work in those circumstances. And a follow-up question, um, they just wanted a bit of clarification. So whether it's a front desk position, maybe it's a janitorial position, are they able to wear masks at work? Is that something that an employer, I guess their question is probably coming from the employee side, are they able to say that they want to wear a mask and is their employer able to stop them from doing that? Well, I think that uh, the employer and the employee or employees would have a discussion. It may be that masks might be at that point, uh, it, there may be a directive <laughs> to wear masks. We don't know that, but if there isn't uh, and the employee desires to wear a mask and their job is such that wearing a mask will not prohibit them from performing their duties, uh, then you know, then the employer, I think, has to act with reasonableness. And uh, if it is the employee's wish to wear a mask, you know, just like it may be a wish to wear a sweater, <laughs> then, uh, you know, then the reasonable decision should be made. And is there um, a guideline that people, that employers should look to for, in terms of physical infrastructure for this? So let's say, does every employer need to have the plexiglass divider between their employee and maybe people they come in contact with? Or do you think when public health opens this up to everyone, that this is something that people are gonna be able to choose at their discretion or what with whatever is you know capable for their own capacity? Yeah, I mean, uh... Clearly, the distance guideline has to be followed. So if someone is standing six feet away and talking and maintains the distance, and there are lots of ways to maintain the distance, people put up barriers so that someone can't get closer, uh, then there may not be a need to be putting up plexiglass dividers, uh, which may or may not be of any assistance in preventing the spread of COVID. And kind of staying on the similar topic of 
um, trying to make workplaces safer. safer. Um, someone asked, can an employer ask for hazard pay for jobs that have become more dangerous because of COVID-19? So the example they were giving, like for example, PSWs, their jobs are significantly more challenging and dangerous right now. <laughs> um, yeah. some, some employees have asked for, uh, for uh, danger, call it danger pay or, you know, some kind of extra pay for uh, frontline work. Uh, if they're unionized, then that is a, an issue that a union will, will raise with the employer. Uh, for non-union employees, you know, it's not generally part of the employment contract. And uh, there would have to, you know, that, that would be a bargain between the employee and the employer, uh, which is outside the normal terms and conditions of employment. There's no obligation per se to provide someone with extra money. Okay, thank you. And shifting gears a little bit, I see a lot of people asking about the wage subsidy and specifically that they're, what they're reading is that saying it's like a paid leave, but what they feel is that there's actually a lot of jobs that, that can be done online. So if someone is getting the wage subsidy, are they able to still ask their staff to complete work online? Oh yeah, no, the wage subsidy is there for only for people who are working. It's not available, the, the, the other one, the CERB, is for those who are not working. The wage subsidy is available for, to get that employees must be working in some way, either physically at your place of employment, your actual physical location or, on, or at home. Okay, thank you. And then another question that was kind of similar, which really just goes to what you were talking about, is if someone did lay off their staff um, and they um, applied for the CERB, and so now the staff is getting paid, they wanted to have clarification on if they can ask their staff to work while they're getting that payment for being unemployed due to COVID. It looks like Gita's um, audio has just cut out for a second, so we're just going to do the same thing where we just wait a quick moment for it to come back on. And in the meantime, we are definitely going through your questions, so please feel free to keep sending them, and we're going to try to get to as many as we can. I'd also to, like to invite Bill back on if he'd like to join the question and answer session, as we do have some questions also related to policy. Perfect. Thank you, Bill. Um, so I'm going to be going through some of the questions and um, either Gita can answer them or Bill can answer them. Um, but one of the ones we had was about the recent announcement of the $350 million in funding. And what people are wondering is if you're not an agency that's currently funded by the United Way and you're not currently funded by government, are you still able to access these funds? We're still waiting to see some of the specific details. My understanding is that it's not limited <clears throat> to organizations that are currently receiving funding from either United Way or Red Cross or a community foundation, that it's um, they're the distribution channels um, and they'll be administering it, but it's not limited to current recipients. That's my understanding. Um, there was also um a a phrase in the announcement that um some funds would also be provided directly to frontline organizations um rather than going through those uh national organizations um again we don't know how much that's going to be or what the mechanism what the mechanism will be to apply so as soon as we have that information we'll be passing that along to people Perfect, thank you. And we will be sending the links to the Imagine Canada web pages, so that way you can sign up for their newsletter and as updates come in, you can get them sent directly to you as well. So I'm just trying to go through all of these great questions. Um, 
so one of um one of the questions that we have is what are employment coalitions doing specifically to plan for the next crisis so have either of you heard about anything um, rather than focusing on how do we adapt from this crisis how do we prepare and prevent um, I guess some of the things that have happened while also supporting more vulnerable workers and volunteers in the future well um from my part, pandemic planning uh, is something that uh, some of the occupational health and safety uh, umbrella groups are offering. Uh, and uh, certainly there are, um, you know, <laughs> it's top of mind now uh, and will be moving forward because there is some uh, I think it's more than supposition. There, there is, uh, there are predictions that this pandemic will come in waves, and that we will face this situation, perhaps uh, maybe not to this extent, but to some extent uh, over the next few months and uh, maybe a couple of years. We don't know. Uh, so at this point, all the planning that you can do <laughs> is uh, to to your credit because. Uh, I, I think that this uh, situation is is not going to be over when it's over. Uh, one of the things that uh, we can watch is that uh, you know today the government of Saskatchewan um, announced that it would be start reopening, and they said this morning that they are going to reopen in five phases, and so uh, I think all of our provinces will be watching and and, and when you look at the, at the statistics for Saskatchewan the, their curve is flat so they have very few cases you know and very few um uh, you know they 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 are i suppose uh, primed to be one of the first openers but it will depend uh, on how they do it and i know they uh, have said there will still be travel restrictions there still will be distancing. There, there still will be restrictions on groups gathering, and so you know there will be. I think in all of our jurisdictions, uh, phases to the reopening of of not only our social milieu but also our businesses and our our employment. Uh, so we'll see how that goes, <laughs> and uh, I think employers will have to plan. Uh, in accordance with how this works, and I think the government is governments are focusing on now the reopening strategies, and they will have to dovetail um, the strategies with which will enable people to return to workplaces. So, uh, you know, for example, they will have to deal with how they're going to manage schools reopening and daycare reopening with uh, the reopening of uh, non-essential businesses because people need childcare to be able to go to work. So this will all hopefully be coordinated and everyone will be watching right now Saskatchewan. And we actually have, um, that was a really, um, thank you so much for those insights. We actually have a question that really relates to what you just said about schools opening up. Um, we have a few of them actually. So I think some of them are about when schools do open up, if an employee says, I don't feel comfortable sending my kid to school because I feel like, you know, it's a danger to their health, at that point, are they able to say that they're refusing to work and they need to stay at home or that they can work from home while taking care of their kids at the same time? Or as an employer, if schools are open, can you say, no, you still need to come into the office because you have that opportunity to send them to school? Yes. Yeah, so this is close to the question of uh, people returning from maternity leave who don't want to put their child in daycare. So uh, oftentimes one will get a question, well, why can't I just work at home? Uh, and so I would say that, uh, you know, the employer at that point would be able to say, well, you, you're coming to work, you have to work. Uh, although, <laughs> I'll say that, the traditional answer would be uh, an employer would insist if the work has to be done, 
uh, and there is the pathway for the child to go to school and it is deemed to be safe. However, what we're learning in this pandemic is that uh, there are more and more, there's more and more work and more and more jobs that seem to be able to be done uh, remotely. And we see this uh, in, you know, broadcasting, we see it in, in all of our, much of our work, we see it in, in law, we see it, you know, <laughs> everywhere. So there will likely have to be uh, some, first of all, acknowledgement by employers that it is, uh, they have to be a little more broad minded about what work can be done at home and be certainly more convincing about why employees must be in an office or a workplace. And I think that this will lead, uh, this whole experience that we're all going through will lead to a greater acceptance by employers uh, about the location of work. The work was already moving towards a more virtual uh, situation and, and certainly large companies and firms uh, were having, you know, there were things like hoteling where you could come into the office a couple times a week and book an office to use, but primarily you were doing work at home. And I think that in this uh, pandemic, we are learning what work can be done at home and, and it may not be ideal and there may be efficiency issues and there may be uh, technology issues and there may be other issues, but are those issues insurmountable? And that is something that employers will have to grapple with. Thank you. I, I think that's a really insightful answer and I think it also applies to some of the other questions we've had. So just how you said it applies to people who are maybe coming back from maternity leave. I think it also applies to people who maybe are more vulnerable to getting COVID-19. Would that be correct? That if someone is more likely to get COVID-19, that employers should try to make accommodations even if everyone else is returning back to the office? Are you still there? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry okay, about that. Okay. Yes, like um, certainly. People with underlying medical conditions or who are more vulnerable or who have greater likelihood of, uh, of contracting COVID-19, uh, you know, will get into an issue of accommodation and whether or not the employer has the, uh, has the obligation to accommodate such employees. And, and certainly, let me just add that the human rights uh, Commission of Ontario has issued a policy statement saying that employers should accommodate uh, COVID-19. They're treating COVID-19 as a medical condition uh, that, that needs accommodation. Okay, great. And the last kind of um grouping of questions I'd like to ask today because we have had a few questions about them but um, we've had a lot of questions about how to what is the definition of revenue and was the definition specifically for revenue loss so we had some people who are asking you know what happens if I had a revenue loss but it wasn't because of COVID so if they lost a grant let's say in December so it had nothing to do with COVID-19 can they still apply for the wage subsidy even though that wasn't why their revenue was lost. So could you maybe clarify, um, whether it's you or Bill, maybe just what does revenue loss, um, what is the definition of the revenue loss and what's included in that? I'm gonna ask Bill to uh, chime in on that one. I'm really not a, <laughs> an expert <laughs> in, in revenue, so. Well, yeah, from, um, from what, we've seen so far is um, there's 
there's no test to prove that the revenue loss was caused by COVID. Um, so essentially, um, charities and nonprofits, um, they, there's there's some flexibility at the outset in terms of how you actually calculate your revenues. Um, so first off, you can take your March 2020 revenue, you know, for for that first month worth of eligibility. You can either compare it to March of 2019, or you can compare it to January, the average of January, February of 2020. Um, if you use March 2019, then when it comes to April and then May, you have to look back to April and May last year for eligibility for those months. If you use that January, February average, then you use that each time you're calculating. So that's the first thing. The second thing that they've done is you can choose as an organization whether to include the revenues you receive from government or exclude those. So if you get a fair amount of your revenue from government, um, but then your other revenues have dropped, you can factor out the government revenues and just look at those other revenues um, in order to qualify. Or if it's the opposite situation, your other revenues have held stable, but you've lost your government funding, then um, you, you can choose whichever method you want. Um, just whichever method you choose, you have to use it each month. Um, as well, you can choose whether you use cash or accrual so um for your accounting so you know monies that were supposed to come in in march but you didn't get the cash um you can just count your cash flow rather than the receivables and and what the accountants would normally do so there's a fair bit of flexibility there um the 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 goal that's been stated is that they want as many organizations to qualify as possible so, um, so like I said, there's no test to prove that the revenue loss was caused by COVID. Um, you either lost, your revenues are either down or they're not. Um, you don't have to give a, a reason for that. And um, with, all the, with all the different permutations of how you can calculate it, um, you can basically, as an organization, um, choose whichever one gets you into that um, that category of qualifying as long as you then use that same method each month going forward. Great, that answer is so helpful. Um, I think that answered so many of the questions that we had. So I would like to leave it on that note. Um, but before we finish, I just wanna say thank you so much for Gita for taking the time to do another presentation with us and for Bill for providing your updates and also the useful information for the nonprofits and charities on the call. And lastly, thank you so much for everyone who joined this call. We're always grateful to have your support and we look forward to doing more webinars with you in the future. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks, you too, bye.